welcome to Read Brave, a comics podcast from the Graphomania Podcast Network. I'm Vinton Vane, and, and today I have a special announcement for anyone who isn't on Twitter. I am taking the month of July off because I will be traveling, and it would be pretty impossible for me to take all my podcast equipment with me and find guest hosts and come up with segments while I'm traveling. So, for the month of July, we will not have new episodes, but I really wanted to talk to you guys about Spider-Man Homecoming. This movie was fantastic. I loved it so much. And because I do another comics podcast with some lovely friends of mine, Alistair and Sarah, we had the opportunity to talk about Spider-Man Homecoming just after I had seen it. I actually watched it twice. I watched it Thursday night before I went to bed, got up and went straight to the theater and watched it again with them and then went straight from there to record that podcast so i'm going to just drop that episode in here for you to listen to and you should all check out back catalog of excelsior we have quite a few episodes up by now i don't remember the exact number but it should be enough to keep you satiated until i return in august thanks for listening everyone and i hope you enjoyed this episode of excelsior Hey, everybody from Common Room Radio. I'm Sarah Kate Pazan. And what are you hiding, Vinton? I'm just kidding. I don't care. Bye. And I'm Vinton Bain. And I was just trying to be like you. I'm Alistair Stevens. And I need you to be better. <laughs> this week, you guys, Spider-Man Homecoming. Was that a good? I, like, I feel like our energy was not as high as it usually is for that whole thing. I think that's because we're still reeling. We literally yes. just watched this film. Yes. Vinton has watched it twice in the last yeah. 12 hours, which is an extraordinary <laughs> and possibly super heroic feat. We <laughs> just got out of the movie theater, yes. ate diner lunch, and came here to record. Uh, yeah, yeah, reeling is a good... This is my favorite superhero movie. <laughs> yeah, I think it might be mine too. Yeah. yeah it's pretty fantastic. We're going to do things a little bit different here this time since we're recording so quickly on the heels of the film. A lot of you may not have seen the film yet, so we're going to talk non-spoilers for a little while. We will give you a spoiler warning later in the episode when we're going to dive into those. Here's a spoiler alert for you. This movie is amazing. <laughs> ultimate, even. It is the ultimate Spider-Man film. It's pretty spectacular. It's, it's astonishing. <laughs> it's a tangled web. Wait, what am I doing? <laughs> Hang on, wait. It's Miles Morales. Wait. <laughs> it's Spider-Gwen. <laughs> <laughs> so, before we get too much farther in, let's flip over the VHS. Underoos is back with his own movie. <laughs> Rebooted once again after Sony finally realized they were dropping the ball. Iron Dad steps into a fatherly role to mentor an actually high school age Peter Parker as he faces off against Batman? I mean, Birdman. I mean, Vulture. What is it with this guy? Your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man has cemented his place into the MCU. And it's so perfect, you guys. I can't even see this movie. This is my Peter Parker. This is my Spider-Man. It's so great. Yeah. That, I think, covers it. That that does the whole A, you've killed Sarah. Oh, so D, you've said pretty much everything we need to say. Birdman. (laughs) Hey guys, remember when Michael Keaton was Batman? Remember when someone thought that was a good idea? Was that in the year 1988, <laughs> the year that I was born upon this earth? In the year 1989. Oh. The year which you were one year old. Oh, well, I was a one year old. 91. Mm-hmm. True. And then the movie that was a commentary on Michael Keaton's life and his starring role in Batman, Birdman? Yeah. Pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. Which has Emma Stone, who played Gwen Stacy, so it's all connected. It is all connected. That is true. All you have to do is make six Spider Man movies in the last 15 years, and suddenly everything is connected. It's yeah. perfect. Yeah, it's yeah. basically Kevin Bacon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I really appreciate that they rightfully don't do an origin story this time. And yes. We're also not going to do that. I'm not going to tell you the history of Spider Man here on this podcast because you probably know and don't want to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I have a Wikipedia page open. I think I can. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much gloss the origin if I need to, just to stay up with the well, conversation. He was, he was bit with a spider, right? That's how it happened. Is it a spider? I, I knew he was bitten by something. And then somebody uh, dies. Was yeah, it yeah, yeah. his parents, Thomas and I Martha? It was, his, it was his cousin. Uh, no, no, it was his mom. Martha. Oh, Martha. Oh, Martha. Oh, Martha. Oh, Martha okay. Spider-Man okay. died, okay. and then <laughs> Peter Parker became the Spider-Man. <laughs> So this film was directed by John Watts, who is a director, producer, and screenwriter that I was completely unaware of before uh, this. Yeah, me too. He uh, has a very short list of works of writing and directing. Uh, the f- horror film Clown, the thriller Cop Car, and he directed episodes of the Onion News Network TV show. 
What? That is, that is mean, his whole good guitar. It's it's good to work. I have yeah. no idea about any of those things, but that's awesome. When it comes to the writing credits, there is a bit more of those. John Watts <laughs> did work on the screenplay as well as directing. The uh, team of Jonathan Goldstein and John Francis Daly worked on the screenplay and the story together. And then we also have Christopher Ford, Chris McKenna, and Eric Summers also working on the screenplay there. Uh, Jonathan Goldstein is a screenwriter, director, television writer, producer, known for his work on The PJs, if you remember that show. Yes. Uh, oh, wow. Show. Yes. Um, uh, Wait, yeah, I do. Yeah, the also worked on uh, The New Adventures of Old Christine, Horrible Bosses, uh, in the vacation film with John Francis Daly, who's his writing partner. John Francis Daly is Sam Weir from Freaks and Geeks, one of my favorite mm -hmm. shows. Oh, my gosh. Uh, so th those two work together pretty often. You might also know him from Bones. He played, I think, Lance Sweets on Bones. Uh, also worked on Horrible Bosses and did The Incredible Burt Wonderstone and Vacation with his writing partner. Chris McKenna, on the other hand, has worked on American Dad, Community, and The Mindy Project. He is actually known for writing some of the most critically acclaimed episodes of Community, including Paradigms of Human History, Conspiracy Theories and Interior Design, and Remedial <laughs> Chaos Theory. So there's a lot of community connections there, and he actually has worked with the Russo brothers on, on that sitcom, of course, and then he also contributed to the script of The Winter Soldier. So well. what we're learning is that if you want a really good standout superhero film, you grab comedy TV show writers and yes. make them do your superhero yeah. film. Yeah. Specifically community and Arrested Development. That's Specifically right. those, yeah, exactly. yes. If you want a good superhero movie, hire good writers. Yeah. Oh. This Speaking cool. of, Eric Summers was in the co-executive producer on Community, and he worked on the <laughs> Screenplay. He also worked on the screenplay for Lego Batman, which I think I is, love is a good Lego pull. Batman. Yeah. Oh my gosh, we need to do uh, Lego Batman. Yes. We sure yes. do. Uh, Christopher Ford is the last of the screenwriters, and the reason he's a screenwriter on there is he actually works with John Watts pretty often. They wrote all their movies together that they've done mm -hmm. up to this point. But this doesn't seem like a film that was written in a bunch of pieces. Seriously. It seems like a team yeah. really nailed this thing down. Right. Whenever yeah. we got to the end of the film and it showed that there were, I mean, three teams of two who worked, so six writers on this movie, I was. I mean, gobsmacked, I think is a good word because like our general rule is like, what, if you get like three or more writers, then it's just complete garbage and yeah. everything like just goes straight to hell in a handbasket. But this movie, I mean, I feel like the script was really tight. It was, re I mean, everything, it's just, God, this movie is so good. Um, and I, w I really was just absolutely shocked that we had that many writers, but I mean, they really did knock it out of the park. This movie is a triumph. Right. And then in the movie we have starring Tom Holland, as we already mm -hmm. were introduced to. You mean Peter to. Parker? You mean yeah. we just Peter have Parker. Peter Parker? Uh, finally, we have a young Spider-Man he feels like he's even a little younger than he actually is in real life, which yeah. I really appreciate yeah. that he can play a 15-year-old, even though I think he's like 18 or 19 at this he's, point. He was turned 20 while shooting oh, this man, movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, yeah. he's off. such a little guy. Yeah. A little baby guy. Uh, we also have Michael Keaton, of course, Batman, Birdman, and now the Vulture. Uh, we also have Zendaya, whose name I had heard a lot, but I can tell I'm getting older because I had no idea who this was going right. into the film. Uh, apparently, some Disney Channel, some singing career. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. She's really popular with the kids these days, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> but she was fantastic in this She was film. so I really good. Loved her. good. And then playing Flash, we have Tony... Revel Laurie, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but I really loved him in Grand Budapest Hotel. Yes, he had a yes. really standout role there, so I was excited to see him step into this role. Mm -hmm. And I really actually liked that they don't have the big white guy jock here as the bully, because it's not really what you see as bullies anymore yeah. in the world that we live in, where mm -hmm. cyberbullying is way more the thing, and it's really hateful commenters and that type of thing. That yeah. You don't have to be big and buff to be a bully anymore. Yeah. No, you you can be the be small vicious guy. Yes. With a popped collar. Exactly. Yep. Flash Thompson <laughs> is the worst. I'm going to habitually refer to him as Flash Thompson, even though he's not credited as Flash Flash Thompson, his surname is probably not Thompson, you guys. It's probably something else, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Flash Thompson is the archetypal bully, and this is a brilliant version of that character for 2017. I'm hesitating only over the year because I'm not entirely sure when this movie is set. No. Maybe 2020? Yeah, we, Maybe? we know that it is eight years after the events of the first Avengers movie. We yes. get that for sure. It's right there at the beginning. Uh, there's something later on that tells us uh, that the first Iron Man movie took place in 2008, so it cements mm -hmm. it there for us. Uh, but we really, either this is taking place in 2020 or... Or Avengers took place in 2009, a year after Iron Man became Iron Man. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't hold any water at all for me, no. particularly with the specific reference in the movie to Iron Man becoming Iron Man in 2008. We have to be in 2020 in the MCU mm -hmm. now, which is actually fine. I don't have a problem with that. What's most interesting is that this pushes Civil War all the way back to 2020 yes. as well, which is yeah. really interesting. We've got some space now. We've talked a lot while we were discussing the Cap movies about this timeline and about the fact that the Cap stories in particular have taken mm -hmm. place within a very short span of time. 
that doesn't now seem to be true. Oh, wait, wait, okay, so hang on. If, we, if we're switching the events of Civil War over to 2020, does that mean that we're also changing when Age of Ultron happened? I have no idea. Because if we aren't, that means that, like, Wanda has been a part of that team for, like, four years now at that for, point? For, like, a good long time. Wow! Yeah. Yeah. That's why, which suddenly it makes sense why nobody's mentioning Pietro. <laughs> Tommy wimey wibbly wobbly None of it makes sense. Yeah, it really doesn't matter in the end. It's like we mentioned with X-Men movies. Every time they do an X-Men movie, they go, now this is the truth and forget what we've said in the past. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Nothing that has happened before actually happened. Right. <laughs> there are some interesting notes about people that could have been in this film that I want to point out. Uh, Brian Cranston had shown a lot of interest in playing a Marvel villain, particularly Norman Osborn <laughs> slash the Green Goblin, which would be really interesting and maybe interesting in the future to see uh, something from that could have been i had the dubious fortune to watch the new power rangers movie this last week in which brian Ooh. cranston plays zordon <laughs> I, he's fine he's brian cranston <laughs> that movie's a weird weird film mm -hmm. it succeeds in a number of ways in which it should not conceivably succeed mm -hmm. and then fails to hit everything that you would expect a power rangers movie to do we're not here to talk about power rangers but let me tell you in this two-hour movie it takes an hour and a half for the power rangers to show up an hour and a half before they morph, you guys. That's ridiculous. It is. But before that, there's a lot of teen drama that isn't Power Rangers, but is actually pretty good. <laughs> it's a weird film. I'm sorry. I just have Power Rangers on my mind a lot these days. It's fine. Go back to your Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things that we all knew going into this movie that we weren't going to see because it's been all in the news is that they weren't going to pull anything from the Daily Bugle, that J. Jonah Jameson wasn't going yeah. to be in this story because they're focusing on the high school and so that part of his life isn't going to be a part of it yet. But J.K. Simmons had expressed interest in returning uh, to his rep reprise his role from the Sam Raimi trilogy, but now, of course, he's Commissioner Gordon for the <laughs> Justice League. Wait, what? Very interesting. Oh, yeah. And he buffed up, too. Oh! If you haven't seen muscly the man. He's terrifying yeah. he's terrifying now <laughs> spider-man better get him those or peter parker better get him those pictures of spider-man <laughs> <laughs> or he will tear his arms off that's right oh my god spider yeah. no spider-man your arms are gone <laughs> vincent d'onofrio has also shown interest as in appearing as wilson fisk slash the kingpin reprising his role from daredevil mm -hmm. but he did an amazing job with that. i could i didn't watch all of daredevil oh, no. but he yeah, was he's fantastic, fantastic. He's one of the best villains I've seen portrayed on TV for sure. It mm -hmm. was amazing. And he really did want to come into the Spider-Man universe. I, they still have, are putting that off, saying we're not going to combine these. They're technically in the same universe. We're not going to combine <laughs> anything. It's really bothering me. I, I, I I'm sorry. Do something with it. Sony, Sony, if you can hear my voice right now, you've already done it. This is the most MCU movie that we have seen. I this literally just read so a Time MCU. article that said this is the most Marvel movie that ever marveled. It is <laughs> insane yeah. how connected this is. Yeah. We were talking yeah. about the trailer to Spider-Man Homecoming and how excited we were. And, well, it's going to be great that we'll get Spider-Man and probably a cameo from Robert Downey Jr. But hey, let's be honest, that's going to be it. Sony's mm -hmm. not actually going to connect this to the rest of the MCU. Yeah, sure. Yeah. This is so profoundly, fundamentally integrated with the rest of the MCU, and I am thrilled for like that. literally right. if avengers hadn't happened this movie would not happen exactly right yeah. we get like not see... just in real life but like within the fiction of the film yeah absolutely and we get shots of civil war from a new pov and within which is this so film good. yeah which it's i thought was astounding. just gonna be advertising when we got those teasers from that but that's actually part yeah. of the movie which i thought was really great really great idea to do there and i my main point on that, though, was just that I wish that the that Marvel would allow the Netflix stuff to be more part of the movies. Because yeah, or even the it, ABC really stuff. Yeah. It would be really cool if we could see Kingpin step in because Kingpin is a villain of Spider-Man in the comics quite often, more often than not even. Yeah. He has become a bigger villain of Daredevil through the years, but he was always part of an, an integral villain of Spider-Man as well. There's a profound tonal challenge if you're going <laughs> to have Tom Holland go up against Vincent D'Onofrio. Like because it. Daredevil is very, very dark. And yeah. I'm not sure how you managed to I don't navigate know. I mean, that. Tom Holland dies, right? That's death of Spider-Man. <laughs> yes, and that's when yes. we, you know, bring yes. in Spider-Gwen. He's reduced to his constituent parts yes. by the fists of Vincent D'Onofrio. That's the only way that that plays out. It's, it's, I mean, I get it. I like that. I think it's probably smarter for the Netflix shows to be siloed off in their own little continuum there. Mm -hmm. Because they can then be more adult and we don't have to connect them sure. back to the mainstream MCU. I would like to see stronger connections between the MCU movies and the stuff that's happening on ABC right now. Right, yeah. We'll see how that goes with the Inhumans. Which yeah, we I guess week. so. <laughs> <laughs> 
one of the interesting pieces of uh, notes, of production notes, was that originally the, with the Sam Raimi trilogy, they were going to be making a fourth one. They had already started planning out. Vulture was going to be the bad guy in mm-hmm. that one, and they had actually cast John Malkovich to play the Vulture, so he oh, could have so been playing the Michael Keaton role there, which I think would have totally fit those films better and oh, yeah. would not have played well in this film. No, mm-hmm. no, I completely agree. I, I think Michael Keaton is astonishing he, in this movie. Is I think my favorite antagonist in all the MCU, and you all know how much like Ultron yeah. has a place in my heart. Yeah, he's <laughs> he's right up there. He's and, and very good, human and flawed, yes. and frail in a really yes. interesting way. Yeah. We gotta hurry up and get through this like spoiler free zone because man, I want to <laughs> talk about this movie. <laughs> Uh, it's also interesting to me that we have Iron Man as this mentor role, like we see in all the trailers and uh, all all the advertising. Really, yes. Iron Man is yeah, there. Yeah. God, Nick, he does such a good job. Nick Fury was originally going to be Peter's mentor in this film, but because I guess of the chemistry that the two actors had in Civil War, they decided mm-hmm. to switch that over. And I'm really glad they did. I'm super glad too, because as we know, like from the history of this podcast, Nick Fury only collects like powerful young women to mentor. <laughs> like he stays away from the guys. <laughs> So, yeah, this, as I mentioned in the flip the VHS part, is my Peter Parker. This yes. is my Spider-Man. This is so much fun. The way Spider-Man is even animated in this is so much more real to me from what I see in the comics than any of the other films have been. The way he flops around and flips, mm-hmm. uh, even, like, takes a fall here and there. He's not perfect. He's learning his powers. He's figuring out yeah. how to do this thing. Oh, and it just felt so right. I've never... I've never felt it be more like the comics and in all the ways that's kind of weird to say because the comics started in the 60s. Right. But I think they really took a really good note from the ultimate Spider-Man to adapt and mm-hmm. move forward with what culture looks like now, what, what being in high school looks like mm-hmm. now. And then, of course, the director of this film really pushed John Hughes movies on all the actors, having them watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off and The Breakfast Club and these <laughs> things as movie marathons before actually filming. And you really feel that, that you get this 80s vibe and not, not to mention there is like an 80s dance uh, p- themed party going yeah. on right. in high school mm-hmm. but there's just everything all sorts of things like one of the things that happens right away that you see just slightly in the trailer but you don't uh, get what is actually going on he's running through some backyard Spider-Man is because he's in Queens and there's no buildings to swing off yeah. which is hilarious Yeah, <laughs> he's like realizing he can't swing off anything he's like this sucks <laughs> and he's running through backyards and he goes into a, the pool scene that you see in the trailer where he splashes into the pool but what you don't see is that Ferris Bueller's Day Off is playing at that pool yep. and it's the same scene of him running through the backyards it's just such a great homage to those John mm-hmm. Hughes films that really yeah. do play in making the high school aspects of this film feel so right. Mm-hmm. Well, this is the important thing about Spider-Man Homecoming, I think, is that we've talked before, I think, mostly about Batman and the degree to which Batman is the man and Bruce Wayne is the disguise mm-hmm. or vice versa. This movie is actually Peter Parker Homecoming. Yes. Peter Parker happens to be Spider-Man in this film, but Spider-Man is not the true identity. There's less of a division, less of a distinction between those two sides of his character than we traditionally see in Spider-Man movies and certainly in the original Spider-Man comics. I am so in for a two-hour high school drama featuring these characters Mm -hmm. without any superheroics whatsoever. They're just great and compelling, beautifully drawn, very modern and diverse and progressive Mm -hmm. characters. I'm in love with that side of this movie. Yeah. Utterly. Sarah, how did this read on high school work for you? Uh, I mean, I think it's perfect. You know, whenever we did uh, Winter Soldier, we were talking about this is a 1970s spy thriller disguised as a superhero movie. Sure. And I really feel like Spider-Man Homecoming is a John Hughes high school movie <laughs> disguised as a superhero <laughs> film. And I mean, it just, gosh, it worked out so beautifully. I was immediately, and, and like, okay, Whenever uh, we've had five Spider-Man films uh, prior to this date yes. um, in the last 15 years, which is ridiculous. Um, <laughs> but like, I always thought, okay, Peter Parker's fine. Like whatever. Like I really like the Andrew Garfield ones. Cause I thought Andrew Garfield was super cute, but mm. I mean, I was immediately connected to Tom Holland's Peter Parker and like, just believed everything he was doing on screen. Like I, I mean, okay, you guys went and saw that we all three got to go see this movie together, which is a rare thing. We almost never get to do that, but I'm glad that we did today. And I mean, like I was just, I was so concerned for him all the time. I wanted him to succeed and I was so worried I would get really big feelings about it and just, I don't know, it was perfect. It's my favorite superhero movie. Like, I always had, you know, like Avengers and Age of Ultron on the top of my list. Spider-Man is on top of that now. That's my favorite one. Everything else goes below it. So to what degree is that a success for the film and to what degree is that a success for the character? Do you consider yourself now a Spider-Man fan? I think so. Like, I mean, I don't know... uh, 
I, it, I I bet like comic book wise, I would be much more interested in like reading like stories about Miles Morales and like mm-hmm. because he's yeah, yeah. still in high school right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if I would be interested in comic Peter Parker, who basically is Tony Stark now with like his big Pretty business, much. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. In um, the six one six at least. Yes, yeah. in the six one six. Um, so I don't know if I would be as interested in that, but I I don't know. I think I think maybe both. I mean, I think this movie is brilliant and wonderful, and I really do. Like, I love this Peter Parker. Mm-hmm. I adore him. I think that he is trying so hard. I, he's trying harder than literally everybody else in the MCU. Like, exactly. nobody, exactly. no other hero is working as hard as Peter Parker. There is a relentless clumsiness, but an energy, an irrepressible energy to all of the choreography in the movie, whether it's just athletic sequences or it's the fight sequences. Peter is trying, just yeah. constantly trying. And you're right, Vinton. He takes stumbles. He'll slip up. He'll fall. He'll crash through the roof of a shed at one point. He'll just pick himself up, dust himself off, and keep going. Mm-hmm. Right. That is what makes him a hero. Yeah, and I think that's why Tom Holland is the perfect casting here. Because you have Spider-Man in the movie here wanting to be a part of this thing that's bigger than him. Wanting to be a part mm-hmm. of this thing with these other heroes who are bigger than him. And wanting to step up and, and fill these shoes of a hero. And what does a hero look like? But he's yeah. new to this and he doesn't know what he's doing. And you have an actor who is in that same position where he's yes. wanting to... Yes. make a name for himself and step up to these bigger shoes like th- these other actors like Robert Downey Jr. who yeah. is uh, prolific at this point. And so he wants this just as much as the character wants what he wants. Yeah. And so that energy just transposes right into it perfectly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So before we jump into our spoiler comments, where <laughs> does this movie fall for you? Let's go ahead and throw that out there for, for our listeners. How did you feel about this movie overall? Uh, I really do. Okay, so like, I think that in my top five superhero movies right now, I think that it's Spider-Man: Homecoming, Civil War, Avengers: and Age of Ultron together at number three, mm-hmm. uh, and then probably Winter Soldier and Captain America. No Wonder Woman in that top five? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Wonder Woman's <laughs> in there somewhere. Uh, Spider-Man, Wonder Woman, MCU, rest of MCU. Well, okay, the rest of the MCU. <laughs> sure. Uh, it is for me definitely a top three movie. It might be my number one movie. I have to see it again and think more right, about it. Right. It is still right. very fresh and raw and urgent and brilliant and dazzling. But yeah, definitely top three superhero movies of all time. And conceivably, like in my top 10 list of all movies of all time, sure. it's incredibly good. Yes. Yeah, and I don't want to be too capricious because, I mean, obviously when we did Wonder Woman, I was waxing poetic about how great what. And I still think that Wonder Woman is an amazing film and absolutely brilliant and one of my favorites. But, I mean, I did just get out of the theater seeing this movie. Um, but I don't remember where I ended up ranking Wonder Woman. But, I, I mean, like, these are, I mean, these are two of the best superhero films I've ever seen yeah, ever. It's extraordinary. Ever, ever. Absolutely. The Vin- fact that these movies just keep getting better is yeah. so insane to me. Everyone every year is like, well, the superhero movies are over. They're going to die now. People are good. They're just going to start getting bad. I keep hearing that every year and every year it it just becomes less and less true. Yeah. It gives me so much hope for Ragnarok and Black Panther. Those movies are going to be phenomenal. Those are two perfect examples of the kind of, of narrative diaspora that we're seeing within the superhero space. You're right. This is a John Hughes movie disguised as a superhero Mm -hmm. movie and Guardians of the Galaxy is a space cartoon disguised as a superhero (laughs) movie. Absolutely. It it might just be a space cartoon. That's fair. Actually, for Guardians, that's super fair. Yeah, but not this guy, but this has like a label. <laughs> <laughs> this, uh, the idea that you can use superheroics not to limit and constrain your stories, but to just literally empower your stories, yeah. to raise them to this melodramatic state, I think that's perfect. And we're saying Wonder Woman is a war movie. Yes. Spider Man is, you know, a homecoming high school date movie, essentially. Mm-hmm. These stories are going to continue to expand as we begin to draw more and more genres into the superhero yes. universe. Yes. Superhero storytelling isn't a genre. It's a tone. It's yes. a style. And that's all. We're going to get superhero horror movies and we're going to get superhero yeah. westerns and we're going to get superhero rom-coms. Been a and it's all going to be magnificent. Movie? I'm just not thinking that there was in fact a superhero western. Did they make the Jonah Hex movie? I never they saw did the make Jonah the Jonah Hex, Hex movie. Saw it, but they definitely made it. Cowboys also, and Blade, Aliens is Blade weirdly is good. Movie, I think. Uh, that is a weirdly good movie. My favorite part about Cowboys and Aliens is Olivia Wilde. That's so. everyone's favorite part. But <laughs> yes, it's, it's a and solid Daniel piece Craig of work. and Harrison yeah. Ford. A lot of eye candy in that film. In that <laughs> <laughs> so this movie for me, last night when I saw it, I told my wife that it's at least in my top three. For mm-hmm. sure. It's definitely in there somewhere. And I think the other movies in my top three are definitely Civil War and Guardians of the Galaxy, I think, sure. still hold up there for me um, without this, just doing it off the top of my head. I might be forgetting something. But walking away from it on the second viewing, I thought for sure I'd have a more critical eye on it this sure. time. This time I'd be able to see some things I didn't like. 
I liked it more the second time. Oh, that's and so I good. even things I was critical on the first time, I then found reasons for the second time why I shouldn't be as critical about them. And mm-hmm. so it just made yeah. me, I really just fell way more in love. And I can now say that this is my favorite superhero film, maybe my favorite film of all time, being that I love superhero films more than regular films. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it does feel as though it's got some of that uh, Civil War complexity yeah. to it. There's a lot of machinery right under the yeah. surface of this movie. And even from a first viewing, I can see that a lot of it connects. Mm-hmm. A lot of it, you know, supports the superstructure of the film. So I'm really looking forward to seeing this movie again. Yes. Yeah. Possibly it, this evening as soon as we're done with this recording. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then seeing how it all works under right. the surface. Yeah. And I'm really excited for Thor Ragnarok. As we mentioned, yeah. I expect Thor Ragnarok to knock the mess up my top three, too. We'll really? see. But I expect Thor Ragnarok and Black Panther to both n- knock into my top five. For it sure. would be kind of amazing to come out of this year with a brand new top three superhero Seriously. movie. Seriously. Yeah. With Spider Man yeah. Homecoming, Wonder Woman, and Thor Ragnarok. Yeah. I think if those movies are pitched at you, if you are responsive to that kind of storytelling, you could definitely have your entire top three mm-hmm. thrown out yeah. by mm-hmm. this year. Vinton, I wanted to ask you how this movie rates for you, not just as a superhero film, but as a perspective on Spider Man. As the listeners know, you and I are both big Spidey fans. Right, right. This version of this character is he up there for you in the best realizations of peter parker is yes. he the perfect yeah. peter parker <laughs> he, he really is and this is the first time we've seen like i mentioned a younger character and i think that's really important to yeah the we can't start him out as being well as being 18 even though the actor's 30 yeah <laughs> and i just feel like this high school thing is so perfect and his personality like we mentioned the striving to it the mm-hmm. want for this the desire to be this thing and being pushed by something of course you don't get great power comes with great responsibility thankfully this time but the the spirit of it Such is there it's there in this movie it's amazing it, yeah there's a couple times where you're just almost feeling like tony's gonna say it but he yeah. doesn't <laughs> <laughs> Tony okay. Stark would never I, no, say that. I'm going to say outright. If Tony Stark had said that line, I would have walked out of the movie theater. <laughs> well, that's exactly Tony what, Stark, you are not my that's, dad. That's the MCU movie that Sony was going to make. <laughs> right. No, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead, we yeah. got the MCU movie that Marvel made and Sony profited from. <laughs> yes. Thankfully. Thank you. Lord Jesus. <laughs> but yes, this is exactly what I want from the comics. And it's hard to do because you have so many comics to take from. You have so many years. We literally have six, 60 years? 60 years of Spider-Man comics, almost. We're coming up on 60 years of Spider-Man comics here, and that's a lot to pull from, and you have to then modernize it, and so there are going to be things that aren't going to line up exactly, but I think they did such a perfect job Mm -hmm. of bringing him into current times, bringing him into this Marvel Cinematic Universe where you already built a universe where things are different, and things can't be necessarily the same as in the comics because of changes they've already made, Mm -hmm. and yet he fits so perfectly into this, and he fits so perfectly into our time, and he fits so perfectly into who Spider-Man is to me and what he means to me. He also fits so perfectly into our hearts. I had a little Tom Holland shaped hole in my heart this whole time, and I didn't (laughs) know. Now I'm a real boy. <laughs> what I loved it, you're absolutely right. I think that that it, this is a necessarily MCU movie because this Spider-Man is coming into his power in the wake of the Battle of New York. Yeah. We begin the movie with a discussion of the Battle of New York mm-hmm. during the first Avengers movie with the devastation rained down on us by the Chitari. Right. This Spider-Man has never grown up in a world without this threat. Yeah. And that's yeah. crucial, I think, to his understanding of who he, he would have is. been what eight years old when that happened yeah. mm-hmm. seven eight enormously powerful for yeah. a, a kid from queens mm-hmm. i completely agree it's interesting that right at the end of the credits for this movie and stick around through the credits for this movie you guys this is a little post credit sequence that's definitely worth watching um right at the end of the credit sequence there is a special thanks to list and the first name in that list is brian michael bendis mm-hmm. and that is because this version of peter parker really is just the ultimate version of peter parker right. from as the ultimate soon universe. as i was done watching it the first time i said we have to cover Ultimate Spider-Man Volume 1 we on the it. podcast. We Which have now feels weirdly dated because that was written in like the year 2000, right. 1999 yeah. even possibly. I was in high school when I, yeah. when I was picking those <laughs> single issues up from the comic shop. So they've updated it, but nobody has a cell phone. And right. Computers are large and unwieldy and mm-hmm. so on and so forth. But it feels modern and it feels youthful and it feels vibrant in exactly the way that Spider-Man should. This is absolutely right up there for me with the very best depictions of Spider-Man in any medium ever. Mm-hmm he's my guy he's my guy and here he is and i'm so so glad it was only i guess maybe 15 minutes into the movie when i was absolutely certain that this was going to be a success i was Mm -hmm. absolutely certain that they got the tone right they got the characterization right it was only then that i realized how worried i had been that this was going to be an (laughs) utter disaster because if this movie had been bad that's it sony has no actual tie to marvel right this could have just killed the spider-man movie uh, the spider-man character Mm -hmm. outright and he just 
wouldn't have been around for Civil War II, for Infinity yeah. War, for whatever. Mm-hmm. He would have just disappeared. <laughs> hey, what happened to that kid from Queens? I knew what kid. Uh, he's dead now. He's dead he, now. He's dead he dead died. Now. Vincent D'Onofrio killed him. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with that, let's go ahead and head into uh, the spoiler. I w- I'm not going to call it the spoiler zone because it's the whole podcast. Yeah, pause the podcast. Go watch the movie. Now watch it again. <laughs> now read the Wikipedia page. Now watch it again. Now listen to the rest of the podcast. Those are your instructions. <laughs> yes. From here on out, there be spoilers. Man, I can't believe that Vulture wound up being Peter Parker's dad. That was the wildest part. I can't believe his mom's name was Martha this whole time. I can't believe Donald Glover ended up being Uncle Ben. <laughs> it's weird when Deadpool showed up, though, right? I it mean, was, that was unexpected. And like, okay, and not only unexpected, but like I was really uncomfortable with like how touchy feely Deadpool was I, with fifteen-year-old Peter Parker. It's only because he was Parker. naked the whole time. And That's it, what it was made it weird, weird, is what I'm saying. <laughs> the Spidey Pool fandom has too much control, apparently. I, okay. <laughs> All right, real talk, Spidey Pool fandom bothers me. Uh, anyway, moving on. That's fair. There's a lot That's of it. Yeah, I know. It's out there. It pops up on my pictures from time to time. I somehow get trapped there. Which I did like the call out to that by uh, Liz in the in the gym scene where where there she's talking about being having a crush on Spider Man and her friend goes, "What if he's all, all burned?" burned under there? Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, "Like Deadpool." <laughs> It's so good, you guys. This movie, this movie is, movie is so, so good. good. I kind of just want to read through a list of Easter eggs and talk about all yeah, yeah. the ways in which I've this got one. Yeah, hang connects on, to you know the rest of the MCU. Right. I could never have expected it to be this ambitious, to be this complicated, to be this integrated, or to be crucially this respectful. Mm-hmm. I love that this is a movie that takes Peter Parker seriously. We never play him for a joke. In this movie, we no, never not take at all. this notion of heroism for granted. We right. never use it as the butt of a joke, and right. I'm super into that. This movie, though, <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I was really excited about is even though we already knew that Kenneth Troy was going to be in this, uh, and we knew that he was going to be playing, or we thought that he was going to be playing a descendant of Jim Morita from the Holland Commandos, Captain yeah, America. Yeah. Uh, he actually was. He's the principal of the school. And then you you see his uh, the picture of of Jim up there on his desk or over on the shelf there. Mm-hmm. And there's also a picture of a, a group of people, but there's a glare, so you can't see what it is. But I'm assuming it's the Howling Commandos. Standing there with Peggy and so. Steve, yeah. yeah. Right? yeah. So that, that was really exciting. Also at the school, you had the murals that had like Albert Einstein. Those people also had Howard Stark. Yes. And it had Abraham Erskine, Dr. Erskine from Captain oh, America. Mm-hmm. Which makes my heart so glad. Fantastic. And in the back of the science classroom, with the pictures of famous scientists, there's a picture there of Mark Ruffalo as yes. Bruce Banner, which is yes, just yes, yes. great. Yeah, and then we also had Jennifer Connelly playing the voice of the spider suit, <laughs> which I, I knew, you, you heard it a little bit in the trailer, but I just didn't think about it. I didn't think, oh, Spider-Man has his own Jarvis now. Yeah. 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 It turns out it's Paul Bettany's wife. <laughs> <laughs> she does a great job. I love great Karen. I just assumed that Karen was a concept like from the comics. And so whenever I was asking you guys about that, when we went to the diner, I was like, okay, so tell me about Karen. And you both were like, no, it's just a movie thing. And I was yep. like, oh, yes, though, this <laughs> is so, so good. good. Yeah. And yeah. I'm racking my brain trying to figure out if the name Karen has any meaning. And I genuinely yeah, I think know that there it doesn't. I there is a Karen in Spider-Man. And I'm drawing a, a blank. When we got to the naming scene, I was convinced by that point, because the movie was playing so fast and loose with its own continuity, Mm -hmm. that he was going to call the suit AI Mary Jane or Gwen or Mm -hmm. one of these significant names or Uncle Ben. I don't know. That probably would have been less appropriate, but I'm figuring (laughs) he he would have done something more direct there. But this is another movie, just like Wonder Woman, Mm -hmm. that dodges all of these traps. There are so many moments throughout (laughs) Spider-Man Homecoming where I'm thinking don't do it it's just so fantastic to me that we get Donald Glover here especially with all of his wanting to be Spider-Man for so Mm -hmm. long yeah that was a campaign that I was fully behind by the way and I still think that that he would have been magnificent just a few years ago I think he would have been perfect as Spider-Man I am so glad to have Donald Glover in this movie and I love the way that it connects to the entire mythology surrounding Miles Morales Mm -hmm. as a character it's beautifully done. Yeah, that, as soon as uh, they show that he's the Prowler, a.k.a. the yeah. Prowler in the Spidey cam there, and later he says, I have a nephew, and you're just like, oh, it's Miles, it's Miles. Miles. Miles is going to yep. be here some, sometime, hopefully, I assume. So it would be great. It'd in be great. a few years. Yeah. <laughs> we'll even a little bit of time, because Peter Parker has to be able to be a mentor to this kid, I, I would assume. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I've got a list here from, uh, I think it's time, of all of the uh, Easter eggs throughout sure. this film. So it talks about how there are references to the Avengers everywhere. Obviously, we've got Avengers Tower. We see the gang in the bank dressed up as the Avengers. It, it opens up right after the Battle of New York. Yep, yeah. exactly. With that exactly. amazing Chitauri Leviathan yeah. right that, there on yeah, the Yeah, that huge, like, oh. yes. Oh, God, it's so, so good. 
Which, speaking of, one of the things that I didn't really pick up on at first until my second watch was that the vulture runs a scavenging company. He's a scavenger. Oh, like yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. that's so clever. I'm really <laughs> into so that. Great, yeah. That's really, really good. Uh, we get that other, that whole other perspective on the battle at uh, the airport from uh, right. Civil War, which is so good. We see like the little CGI Scarlett Hansen way back in the background. That's so funny. That's, it's really, it's so really good. good. Yeah. 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 So that was really fantastic. Um, We've got a teacher lecturing about the Sokovia Accords, and mm -hmm. uh, we also get, you know, the joke from the gym teacher after we see the cat video where it's like, ah, I'm pretty sure that guy's a war colonel now, but whatever. <laughs> so great. So, so good. Uh, yeah, the Captain America PSAs, which were amazing. Absolutely. Were. Yep. Like, yep. <laughs> they were so good. All the way up till the very last one that you wait all the way through the credits, and then he gives you a little <laughs> speech on patience. And yes. How, you don't always get something great. Sometimes it's not what you want, and you wonder, why did I wait for this? Yeah. <laughs> and then he just looks off camera. How many more of these? Which is what leads me to believe that Steve Rogers did not want to do these. Someone made him do these. I have no trouble believing that Steve Rogers signed up to make PSAs for high schools. But I then, love but then that, that was the last one he made, and he was like, "How many of these you guys want me to do? I've done like twenty now. <laughs> Why am I doing the one on like female health? I don't understand. <laughs> Your Captain America is why. <laughs> Your body's going through a lot of changes, and that's something I know about. <laughs> Maybe you think it's cool, but it's some guy who was frozen yeah. for 65 years. That's a dumb joke, Cap. Uh, Pepper Potts comes back, which was Pepper amazing. Pepper Potts comes back, which is extraordinary. How I much was money so did we give Gwyneth that. Paltrow to come back? I mean, it has to have been a lot. A lot, a lot, a right? A lot. I mean, part of the reason that she's been written out of the MCU is just I think that there isn't space for her in sure. Tony's story. We want right. to do something else with Tony. Kind of and like what we had to do with uh, Jane Foster. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we just don't have space for her in Thor's ongoing story, which is fine, actually. I'm sure. good with that. And I'm honestly fine with Pepper not being there either. But I like her coming back now because it suggests that Tony has reached a kind of peaceful state yeah He's, trying to really get his you know his life together yeah. and trying to you know it, yeah so i thought that, that was really really good um they uh, at their decathlon their trivia game uh, one of the answers to a question is vibranium talking yes. about cap shield and black panther's suit Which we see our excellent. stanley cameo um and then apparently there's a bunch of Spider-Man callbacks. We get the Spider-Man theme that's going over the Marvel logo at Which the is, beginning. Which is so good. This is yeah. so good to me because I, I am really sold on this headcanon of the fact that since Sony is getting the profits of this, they're in control, but they're not doing any of the creative things. That They probably wrote it in their contract that our logo has to show up first. So the movie mm -hmm. opens up and it says Sony. Yes. And then we go to this whole scene with the Vulture, this five-minute yeah. long thing, and then the Marvel logo drops with the Spider-Man thing. And Marvel's like, yeah, you can go first, but we're going to make it to where you're forgotten, and yeah. everyone's going to remember the Marvel logo coming down the the Spider-Man theme playing and not introing the movie. I absolutely, absolutely forgot that this was a Sony movie. I mean, immediately, as yeah. soon as the logo yeah. was off screen. I mean, like, I think it was, I don't know, it was like I had consumed Voidfish Icker about the studio <laughs> Sony, and I see it there, but it's just static in my eyeballs. There's a nice Adventure Zone cut for everybody I out mean, there. technically, consuming the Icker of the Voidfish would mean that you remembered Oh, you're right. Sony. Yeah, someone fed Sony to the Voidfish. <laughs> I wish they would. <laughs> Uh, we get Shocker showing up, two different versions of Shocker. Uh, both versions both, of Shocker both from the Shocker. mainstream comics That's continuity, right. which is we, great. We also get the Scorpion showing up. Yes. Which is a nice Why are all of Spider-Man's villains named after animals? Well, according to J. Michael Straczynski yeah, back in the it, 90s, it's it because of though. animal totems. That's right. He gave what? a reasoning. Magical animal totems. <laughs> and then that was quickly forgotten and yep. sometimes gets brought up like it wasn't forgotten, but it's mostly forgotten. Yeah. The <laughs> real answer silly. is Steve Ditko in the 60s. Well, yeah, because, because, <laughs> it was, because comics in the 60s, yeah, you guys. Because it's yes. a spider versus all these other creatures and then you also have to ask why are all of spider-man's villains always old people yeah and he's so young it's because it's that, that idea of the young going against the old the, the rebellious countercultural rebellion yeah, okay i think i can kind of see where you would get animal totems though because i mean like if you're looking at the spider as like an anansi type archetype mm -hmm. and where he's like this trickster character and all yep. this so okay i i see it's dumb but I see where they well, got it. That was Spider-Man's deal back in the day was yeah. that he was often pitched against uh, characters who were just much more physically powerful than mm -hmm. he was. And that's something that I think oftentimes get, gets lost in adaptations. Yeah. But not in this adaptation. Right. He's smart and he's fast. Yes. Those are his primary characteristics yes, when it comes absolutely. to combat. We only reference Uncle Ben. We don't actually say his name. Uh, we for don't the first have, time. For the first time ever, yeah. we don't have to yeah. watch Uncle Ben get gunned down by some dude. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank God. I the mean, like, five, are you listening, Batman versus also. Superman? You did a bad. You didn't have to show us Bruce Wayne's parents dying again. 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 
uh, can't you just be a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man? Tony says to it's Peter. Pretty nice. Mm-hmm. And then yes. Spider-Man spends much of the third act of the movie running around in what is Ben Riley's Scarlet Basically, Spider yeah, yeah. outfit. He's got uh, the the red hood over with the, yeah. with the sleeveless, which is it's pretty great. It's not as cool looking as Ben Riley's because it's not as well tailored. He's just a kid who yeah. threw together a suit and has <laughs> the mechanical eyes. I'm assuming he looked at the other costume and figured out how to make or something. I don't mm-hmm. know, but they're. Well done, yeah. Yeah, no, very, very good. Uh, This is your chance to kiss her. Karen tells Peter whenever he's saved Liz in the (laughs) elevator referring to the Tobey Maguire and Kirsten Dunst kiss from the first Spider-Man movie by Sam Raimi. You mentioned already all of the references to John Hughes, the the Breakfast Club Mm -hmm. style detention scene that we get. And then, yeah, the Ferris Bueller homage is really good. Uh, And the Iron Spider suit, which Mm -hmm. looked incredible. It looks so good. For sure. I sure hope so. And then uh, talking about Donald Glover being uh, Miles Morales' uncle. um, Well, and the fact that Ned is basically Ganke, from, right? From yeah, yeah. The Miles Morales story. Ned yeah. Leeds, who is a classic uh, Spider-Man character, but th- the way he acts, the way he looks, the role that he plays in this film is Ganke from Miles Morales, yeah. his friend. So it's going to be really weird to me when they do the Miles Morales film because surely they're going to introduce him as a character and people are going to go, this is really familiar. Yeah, why did here? you bring Ned back? <laughs> it might just be the same character. Maybe so. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty great. It'd be really interesting. Uh, We find out that uh, Zendaya is actually playing MJ. She gets called Michelle at one point in the movie, and then at the very end, my friends call me MJ. I thought you said you didn't have any friends. Well, now I do. Yeah, which is really interesting because throughout the production of this film, it was brought up at one point that Zendaya was going to play Mary Jane, and Mm -hmm. the internet freaked out and was super angry. Well, the bad parts of the internet. She's the wrong skin color. She's the wrong hair. And then she posted the picture of herself with red hair and was like, I can have red hair, you guys. I don't know if you know about this thing called hair dye. And then yep. she was like, I don't know if you also know that the last person that played Mary Jane was not a redhead and she dyed her hair. Yes. <laughs> and mm-hmm. so I thought that was really great. And I was like, you get them. Yeah, you get them. Yeah, but you tell them. I actually em. liked it that she wasn't going to be Mary Jane, that they were doing a bit of a change there. And I kind of wonder, they could this could be going one of two ways. Either they wanted to change things up and call her Michelle for a while to subdue the internet fandom and then throw it in the last minute, she is going to be Mary Jane. Or she is just Michelle, and they just threw in that quip of, I actually go by MJ, completely unrelated to Mary Jane, just to make people mad. And I, this seems like a Marvel thing to do for me, like a Marvel Cinematic Universe thing to do. Oh, you guys were super angry about that? Well, we're going to make fun of you for it. Yeah. Yeah. Get mm-hmm. mad about this, and then next time, we're going to introduce Gwen Stacy. It's going to be fine, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> have a different love interest. Uh, and then the last thing here on this article is talking about how Vulture may come back. He knows who Spider-Man is. He knows who Peter right. Parker is. Absolutely. God, that was such a good freaking well, moment in that yeah. post credit sequence. I want to talk a little about that because I guess just talk about it completely out of order because my reading of that was not malevolent. My reading of that was that he was respecting the fact that Peter saved his life because and he also mentions saved his earlier daughter's how life. important mm-hmm. that is. Yeah. You know? And they're kind of even after sure. you know, the exchange in the car, but then he is saved from the burning wreckage and mm-hmm. that's a big deal for this character. And thank God we have an interesting and complex and well-motivated antagonist. In this One movie. of the best right? we've had yeah. in the MCU yeah. in yeah, years. He's right up there with Loki, if not yeah. surpassing Oh Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really interesting to me. I think it's left ambiguous on purpose in that scene. And you could go, again, one of two ways with it. Either he is thinking that he's even with Spider-Man, that Spider-Man saved him, and he doesn't want to throw him under the bus like yeah. that. Yeah. Or he is so mad that Spider-Man botched his operation again, that he's now gone to prison for the things that he was doing, that everything in his life is basically ruined. And he's like, no, that kid is mine. I'm going to kill Ah, him. going yeah. the Voldemort route, I see. <laughs> so, the worst route to go. Well, you know that Sony is trying to put together the Sinister Six by going the Marvel method to create the Avengers. They're going to go Whoa. villain, villain, villain movie, and then push out the Sinister Six movie. Didn't they, did I, they not listen to our podcast about Suicide yeah, Squad? I don't, I don't know what they're doing. It's not going to work out well for them, though, I guarantee it. The, the whole fact that they're making a Venom movie without Spider-Man doesn't make any sense to me because Venom is not Venom well, without Spider-Man. They're saying that now before the release of Spider-Man Homecoming, and it is entirely possible that with the enormous success of this film, they'll, yeah, do something to tie it yeah. closer to sure. Spider-Man because continuity. Mm-hmm. The They'd origin be dumb not to. of Venom requires Spider-Man. Yeah. Yeah. Or Otherwise it's just the symbiote, yeah. right? And, and he's just connected to some dude and there's nothing, because spi- the whole point of it is he connects to Spider-Man first, builds that bond, gets the spider powers, gets yeah. the spider look. That's how he takes on his form and then hates Spider-Man for getting rid of him and that's his whole drive. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. 
So anyway, that was the whole list of uh, Easter eggs there. Uh, well, they actually missed one. It was one of my favorite ones, which is the scene where uh, Peter gets crushed by the the ceiling collapsing on him. That where Vulture. Oh my god, I could not. This is I, taken uh, straight from the comics yes. from Amazing Spider-Man uh, issues thirty-one through thirty-three. It actually takes place in thirty-three, where the Vulture does collapse a building on him. And there you have this whole page where Spider-Man thinks he's dying under this mm-hmm. rubble. The cover is him like holding mm-hmm. it up in this water, like pouring. It's one of the most iconic Spider-Man covers, and it's it was done so perfectly here. Yeah. Tom Holland was so astonishing in that scene. Like, how afraid he was. He's like, he's crying, he's sobbing, he's like yelling for help. And just like, I started crying in the theater because I'm just an emotional wreck on any given Tuesday. Uh, But like, I just... Yeah, it was. I mean, Tom Holland is an excellent actor. He like, really, really just is, really yeah. knocks it out of the park. And that was an amazing, brilliant scene. It's yeah. really great, too, to combine that sequence with the reflection in the water, the, mm-hmm. the half mask reflection, yeah. which is something that Steve Ditko did all so the time iconic. back in the yeah. 60s to show the, the polarization within this character. It's right. God, it's beautifully done. The quote that comes from Amazing Spider Man 33 is this Anyone can win a fight when the odds are easy, it's when the going's tough, when there seems to be no chance. That's when it counts. And that's when Spider-Man summons his strength Mm -hmm. and lifts the wreckage off of himself so that he can Starts by saying, come on, Peter, come on, Peter, and then corrects himself. Come on, Spider-Man, come on, Spider-Man. And just, oh, it's so, so good. good. Also, this movie managed to have four Spider-Man villains in it and do it well, which is something that I didn't think they could have ever done. And of course, not... Not all those villains got their their due. Of course, the sure. first shocker like dies like immediately almost. Yep. He, he shows up and he's already. A I jerk thought that was the anti gravity guy. And, yeah, so he had some time around, but just not as the shocker. And then you get the shocker replacement, just like you get in the comic books. He's there for that, and he's, he looks like we're gonna have more of him. He didn't die. We didn't lose him. He's he's possibly gonna show up again. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I said four, but there's actually five because there's then there's Scorpion. Scorpion's mm-hmm. there, and he has. Uh, when we see him in that final scene, he has something on his arm. There. Something that looks an awful lot like a centipede device. Yeah, and so you to guys. me, that looks like that's oh. like something that's holding his arm together because of an injury he sustained. Yeah. And maybe that's where he's going to put his finger to be the scorpion is like an arm thing rather than having a big tail and looking weird Which in a would look weird, very green, stupid suit. Strange. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it and did really look like the yeah the the centipede slash extremis mm-hmm. yeah. that we mm-hmm. saw back in the first season. And show. then on top of that, the one that most people are probably going to miss is the guy making all the gadgets. Mason for Vulture yeah. is the tinkerer who yeah. was a big Spider Man villain so that's that's five spider-man villains that we got in this film Mm -hmm. done well yeah they they all like of course vulture is the big one and the focus and they did Mm -hmm. that well it's it's something that spider-man 3 really dropped the ball with is trying to put in all these villains and do that properly because Mm -hmm. they tried giving them all equal screen time giving them all an equal amount of weight to carry sure it's not ever gonna really the core narrative of spider-man 3 as it was conceived is smart it's a sandman movie which is great because then you've got a character and sandman's the best part of that who's movie. not actually dissimilar to the vulture in mm-hmm. this movie he's like a down on his luck blue collar kind of guy who has been cursed with powers finds himself a part of a larger world that he's poorly prepared for and is just trying to make his way just trying to protect his right. family mm-hmm. that's a really good story and then you decide that it also has to simultaneously be a venom movie and that's a bad choice. Yes. That's a bad step. Yeah. I never sure saw Spider-Man 3. We're ever going to get a good Venom movie on screen. I don't know. I it's, just don't know that you can do that a character. a difficult thing to do, and mm-hmm. I don't trust Sony to do it. Yeah. No, I certainly don't either. We also get, uh, at one point, whenever we see Happy Hogan uh, packing everything up, and they're moving out of the Avengers Tower and heading to the uh, place upstate, we get mention of plans for Cap's new shield. His, the prototype of his new shield. The prototype of his new shield, which... The Hulkbuster armor. The Hulkbuster armor, and then... Uh, Thor's magic belt, Maging-yard. which yes, yeah, yes. I'm sorry, one more time. Maginyard. Th- there you go. Yes. That was great. Way which harder than meow meow. It's really interesting because we haven't seen that. That is actually a part of, of Thor's mythic origin. Mm-hmm. It, it is a magic belt that he wears that doubles his strength. Mm-hmm. We haven't seen that in the MCU. Unless it pops up in Thor Ragnarok. Knows that Tony has that. Well, that's interesting. This whole sliding timeline thing. Yes. I feel like we could do a whole podcast just about the timeline of the MCU, trying to figure out how it all fits together. We should do that while Vinton's on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think we need Vinton for that. You know what? That's not so fair. <laughs> well, we, and we have something like that belt from Asgard and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., the episode of The Well with the, with the Berserkers. Oh, the, the Spears. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah something not like similar. That. So there's some, mm-hmm. sure. there's some connections there. Yeah. yeah. Good. Well, and the line about Cap Shield is really, really interesting to me because uh, this movie definitely comes after Civil War, right. two months after Civil two War. Months after Civil War. Uh, maybe in 2020, maybe last year. Who knows? Time is a construct. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> but, wobbly. Uh, yeah. So we, 
like Steve doesn't have his shield anymore. He dropped it in Russia after saving Bucky mm-hmm. and after fighting Tony. And my dad made that. Because my dad made that. That's mine. It's not yours. <laughs> Bird costume? I didn't write it. Um, <laughs> God, I love Sharon. Um, anyway, uh, but it's it's it makes me wonder if Tony and Steve are already like communicating, doing like the secret Avengers yeah, thing. Yeah. And if he's already I building think. Cap's new shield That's for the coming infinity war, cause Steve doesn't have it. He went and broke everybody out of the raft right. and then went and chilled out in Wakanda for a while. Tony has completely rebuilt the Avengers bunker, the command center. Yeah. I don't know what we're calling this now. What Avengers do we call that? HQ. That means that the Avengers name has not been completely destroyed by the events of the civil war so Mm -hmm. i'm curious about i think you're right i think this is all purposeful yes i think we're going to get a perspective on on this presumably in black panther Mm -hmm. i can't wait for that movie yeah it's gonna be really good that movie's going to be amazing yeah Yeah, yeah. it's gonna be fantastic i really like the uh inclusion of damage control in this film oh this is a group from the comics that does the same thing they go up and pick up uh after superhero battles and here it seems to be bankrolled at least partially by tony stark himself and that's just a really fantastic thing for me and we had talks for a while of a uh, damage control tv show along the lines of powerless from dc mm-hmm. uh but I, I don't think they ever did anything with that maybe those rumors came from what they were actually doing here in the film Could be. The whole mm-hmm. yeah yeah mm-hmm. it's certainly an interesting concept particularly in the mcu where though we go to great lengths to prevent civilian death sure. in the mcu there is just a ton of collateral damage and someone needs to go and fix all of those well and it's interesting that and like this movie and... tells us that tony has been doing that since the battle of new york like yeah. he did that immediately after the battle right. of new york yeah. so this has been i mean this is another thing that thunderbolt ross just like totally ignored during the whole sokovia Accords <laughs> thing which like, i you, believe yeah, yeah like you guys are causing so much problem we i'm also personally paying for the cleanup of all this shut up tony yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about damage control in the context of the broader MCU, mm-hmm. because why did Ultron not just go there? Why did he not just attack that place and take everything that was contained? Oh, that's it? right. We also get an Ultron head in this movie. Not an well, Ultron, but the Ultron well, head. I, which the was, Ultron I think head. it might be an Ultron head. Is it not oh, the last? So? Yeah, because they, they all had Ultron looking heads. Well, I, no, you know what? It may have been one of the I, previous Ultron bodies because he kept like hopping through bodies. Right, that's true. So it mm. is it is one of, Ult- it's not a sub-Ultron head, which is a great name, by <laughs> the way. Ultron. Absolutely fantastic yeah. for all of his little robots. But yeah, Peter just picks that up out of the backpack and is like, oh, that's bad, and then just chucks it. It brought me so so much joy. <laughs> and we get little beats like the, the sub-Ultron arm cannon. Yes. It's mm-hmm. been retrofitted yeah. into a weapon. That's, ah, this movie, the way that it plays with the rest of the MCU yeah. makes me so happy. Yeah. Well, and it does it without having to, it doesn't take the time, it's like a sub-Ultron, what is that? Oh, you know, Ultron, the robot that Tony Stark yeah. built, and then it really, really, like we just name drop these things and then keep moving forward, you know, trusting that the audience is going to pick it up or that there's going to be a list on the internet listing all the Easter <laughs> exactly eggs and like right. what they all mean. <laughs> and I love that. I really do love that, you know, we are like trusting that Peter is in this world and belongs in this world and all of these characters are a part of this bigger world and Mm -hmm. it all just ties together so beautifully. It's really wonderfully done. Yeah, Yeah. one of the Easter eggs that we haven't mentioned yet, I don't think, is that uh, Betty Brent is there at the school. She is the school newscaster on the the news videos when they're like walking through the halls. Oh man, school news shows. It's done so like cheesy. I love it. They just look at them and they're like, thanks, (laughs) (laughs) Spider-Man. It's it's in Comic Sans in the middle of the tweet. Yeah. It looks like like garbage. It's super awkward. It's pitch perfect. Perfect. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Betty Brant in the comics is J. Jonah Jameson's secretary, later to become a reporter at the Daily mm-hmm. Bugle once. Of course, women could do that thing in comics. Right. Mm-hmm. Because yeah, the 60s, guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she is a big character in Spider-Man comics later. A love interest, Stephen. So it was kind of cool to get that nod to her, even though there wasn't really any connection with that with anything else. She was just there in the background. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool I think see. Betty's most well known from her appearances in the Sam Raimi trilogy because she right. is the secretary to J. Jonah Jameson and is, you know, welcoming to Peter in a way mm-hmm. that J. Jonah Jameson is not you guys i am so excited for what this trilogy is going to do with jameson really because they have to include him at some point yeah and i just i can't wait mm-hmm. I, I want that very very badly at this point yeah Weird that Peter didn't pick up a camera in this entire movie. I was actually yeah, just bit. thinking that when you guys were talking about, you know, J. Jonas Jameson and the Daily Bugle and all that, I don't know if that's going to be a part necessarily I, of the MCU because, I mean, Peter is basically like first pick draft for the Avengers. Yeah, but he turns that down. As right. Yeah, end. but I mean, even when if like, I mean, yeah, I guess that's, God, that scene is so freaking good. Um, <laughs> this is a test, right? Yeah, there's no one behind that door. It's totally fine. Where's the kid? 
<laughs> well, let's talk about that for a little bit um, because I really like that that second beat there because I picked up on it the second time that when he says no, the reason he says no, he says he wants to help out the little guy. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to be the big hero anymore. And that seems to be taken straight from the vulture speech that he gives yeah. Spider-Man when he's explaining himself and why he does what he does and saying that, well, it's, I'm not like Tony Stark. I'm just no. a normal working guy. You can understand that. And everything is given to them and everything is taken from me. And mm -hmm. I have to step up and do something because I'm just a little guy that gets stepped on when there's giants like that. Right. Yeah. Around. Yeah. Vulture. I mean, okay. I know that he was like stealing alien tech and stuff like that, but as far as we know, he didn't kill anybody until he accidentally well, killed Shocker. Yeah, but let's it's be honest. It's basically a victimless crime? It's not, though. Because he he's selling the weapons. He's selling those weapons. Too. Okay. Um, but so did Tony Stark. Yeah, yeah no, so that's did Tony Stark. <laughs> Well, no, that was the thing is that Tony didn't know, right? He didn't know well, where they yeah, were all yeah, ending he, up. He didn't, he didn't necessarily know. Well, of course, no. it was Obadiah Stane who, who did yeah. some of that. But Tony knew that he was a weapon there and like caught Right, right. He, he at really least, I mean, he, he stopped that at yeah. least. And turned into a superhero. And turned into a knows? superhero. The Vulture might too. Yeah, who knows? Oh, man. What did you guys think of the visual design for the Vulture's I thought suit? it was oh, awesome. On really? Point. So yeah. Good. I like really? it. Okay, I great, really like great. the jacket that gave the fur lining there. Yes. Where, where the Vulture usually has that yeah. on his costume. Mm -hmm. Here you have it as a military thing. It's a mil green military yeah. jacket. Yeah. He's got the big metal wings, of course, updating that. I thought they, uh, so yeah. Good. I thought it was badass. I thought that all of the all of the tech looks amazing right. in this movie. And I don't know if it's just, I mean, we get better and better at visual effects every year, but and, and like the just, I told, it's, it's so interesting whenever we're doing these movies and it's like, okay, well, we're going to have Captain America, but we can't have him dressed like he was in the 1940 comics yeah. because it's just going to be absolutely ridiculous. So, like, we're making things more realistic. Um, but, yeah, no, I loved it. I loved yeah. his whole – I loved his whole aesthetic. The, the I was coffee, into it. I really like the cloffy. The cloffy yeah, is the cloffy. genius. Like the aviator helmet with the, with the, yeah. the breathing mask. Yes, yeah, and it's got, idea. like, his HUD so in there as well. Yeah, yeah, no, it and was the so wings, good. I thought they were going to be, like, real stiff, but he actually had, like, robotic control of those wings. He could move things. Yeah, the articulation of the wings is beautiful. Up. Yeah, I think I think the only thing that bothers me a little bit about the Vulture's look is these jet propeller engines, mm -hmm. which apparently give him sufficient lift. We've kind of solved this problem in the MCU. You guys, we have like With four propulsors. different technologies, in fact, that yeah. can solve this problem. And yeah. I kind of wish that we'd gone for something. If it were more, you know, magic high tech, yeah. then I could have believed it more readily. Well, he had to build it in a warehouse, though, is the thing. He doesn't, have all, he doesn't have all of Stark's money. But we could have justified that with, you know, Alien hey, tech. here's a reclaimed Iron Man suit from sure. the battle at the well, end of Iron Man Well, and he even Man finds 30. an Iron Man helmet, and he's just like, F that, and tosses it aside. Yeah, which is an odd beat. <laughs> no, actually. I'm into it. No, he really hates Tony Stark. Yeah, he wants he nothing he to do with that man. But he Tony definitely Stank. wants he wants Tony that uh, crate full of arc reactors, though. That's true. Well, the arc reactor is more useful than the Iron yeah, Man helmet. That's, that's probably fair. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Though one of those might have Friday in it. We don't know for Maybe sure. Maybe so. <laughs> mm. uh, I really liked the the way this movie came to a climax, the way that it wasn't a world-ending travesty, a conflict. Yeah. Like we get so often. There was no big blue laser in the Thank sky. Uh, yeah. uh, it was just this battle between the Vulture and Spider-Man. And that whole plane, plane fight, I was, was so great. stressed out. First of all, it was hard to follow because we're flashing around a whole lot. The plane itself is flashing a lot. There's fire. There's jet engines. I thought that Peter Parker was going to be sucked into a jet engine, and that was how we were yeah. going to handle this whole thing. Um, it just, it was, that was, I think that's my least favorite sequence just because it was, the, because everything else had been so easy to kind of follow along with, yeah. all of the choreography yeah. and everything. This one was the first time where I really noticed, oh, this is, this is the equivalent of our giant action piece. I mean, this is our action it piece, and it's, really it's is. hard to follow. There are moments moments in it that I really enjoy, but I don't know why we had to make the plane invisible. Yeah, guys, why did we do that? That makes it just so much harder to visually parse what is happening in this yes. sequence, uh, though although, it's almost worth it for the joke when Spider-Man crawls yes, over the exactly. camera and we see and the, the image of him on the top of the plane. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good gag. I yes. like that one a lot. I liked it a lot. <laughs> uh, and then when the, when the ship crashes on the beach, my first thought is, oh my God, they're killing people. And I was like, oh no, Chris Christie closed all the beaches. It's fine. <laughs> I don't <laughs> think Coney Island is in no, Jersey, but... but <laughs> <laughs> this is 2020 that governor whoever's in charge of them yeah that, that's true bitches. that's true <laughs> we were all collectively racking our brains after watching the movie when we were sitting in the diner i don't think that peter parker kills anyone in i don't film. think uh, not even accidentally yeah no the uh, as far as i know the only person in this movie who dies is shocker 1.0 <laughs>
Yeah, uh, Spider-Man's really destructive in this, and I like that. Uh, I like that he's messing up. I like that it's it's messy for him, and he's mm-hmm. trying to do the right thing, but he's finding himself messing up left and right. This is a very Spider-Man-like thing mm-hmm. to do. I'm trying to do the right thing, but things keep falling yeah, apart around yeah. me, and people keep getting hurt around me. Uh, but I don't think anyone, they, at least they didn't show us. They could always come back and then uh, do something where they go, oh, I was on that ferry, and my wife fell in. Or, <laughs> I, I am Baron Zemo, <laughs> yeah, Baron Zemo Jr. Baron Zemo Jr. I don't know. Barry, you just go to my house. <laughs> school <laughs> one of, Barry Zemo one of the things that I found interesting that I heard just before the movie was that they weren't going to include spider sense and uh-huh. that's something I didn't realize in the Civil War movie either there's no spider that's sense crazy and I was like, that it hadn't so occurred to me that that's weird not in this to me film. because spider sense is such an essential thing to who spider-man is wow maybe it's just Karen maybe and, Karen is the spider well sense. the direct that could be and the director specifically said that he felt like it had just been overplayed in recent films it was such oh. a focus and so many mm. of the spider-man films he just didn't want to focus on it. he didn't say it wasn't going to be there he didn't say that it wasn't even there now but he didn't want to focus on it. And there are scenes where you go, well, he can't have a spider sense because that wouldn't have happened or this wouldn't yeah, have happened. Yeah. Sure. But there are other scenes like where he is getting shot at or someone's swinging at him like fist wise and he's just dodging left and right where you yeah. feel like maybe he does and maybe he just doesn't know what it is or doesn't He has like a latent spider sense. So I do hope they bring it up at some point because the spider sense is a really cool thing. I really yeah, do like yeah. it. It does bring a little bit more of a anxious feeling when you're watching a fight scene and Spider-Man doesn't have spider sense. Yeah. He doesn't know yeah. when the hits are coming. He doesn't know that Vulture's coming back around for a hit from behind. Sure. Uh, but there's some interesting things that can also be done with the spider sense. Yeah, no, sure. So let's move really quickly through the structure of this film, and this is going to be a gloss because Vinton's seen the movie twice. We have each seen the movie once. Yes. We'll probably return to it, I think, when it comes out on Blu-ray. There's a live so. tweet in our future, let me tell you. Oh, yeah, there is. We begin with Adrian Toomes, with the Vulture, with his wrecking crew, if you like, <laughs> scavenging Chitauri technology in the wake of the Battle of New York. He is then told that this is not a part of his future anymore, mm-hmm. and he takes his toys and goes home and then begins building weapons. We cut forward eight years the famous controversial eight years and we get peter parker going back to school after his involvement in civil war we get this great you know handy cam sequence of civil war Mm -hmm. which i just adore and of him going to berlin and getting his suit for the first time which is a lot of john favreau in this movie which i'm really into by the way we haven't seen this much happy since i don't even know iron man 2 and i think there's some character development here because at the beginning he definitely does not like peter parker he doesn't like having to show this kid around and being right by the end of it you can tell he likes peter Mm -hmm. a lot and he's actually wanting to be around when uh stark is wanting to talk to Peter. you're like actually i want to i want to be involved in this because i feel Mm -hmm. like listen i feel like i'm a part of this now which is really strong and then we get that jarring two month transition where yes. he hasn't received the call and there are just so many beautiful character moments as he's texting happy mm-hmm. just it's peter parker, parker. <laughs> it's, it's so, so good. good the voice of peter throughout this movie is so just strong. perfect it, it just doesn't yeah. slip for me at all we then really begin our action when he stumbles upon the the avengers <laughs> yep. robbing the atm using these high tech weapons that they mm-hmm. presumably got from the vulture and that really kickstarts the whole proceedings. What did you guys make of that Avengers fight? <laughs> Quote, unquote, <laughs> Avengers fight. The faux Avengers. The what did you make of that fight in the ATM lobby? Did that work for you? Because we saw a lot of that in the trailer. Mm-hmm. Right. But most of the trailer didn't make it into the actual movie. Most yeah, of the, those the lines were recut. Yeah. It seemed like it seemed like there was a lot of ADR. Which I'm super into. Lines. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, did that work for you? It absolutely worked for me. I thought that it was great. It was really excellent. I love whenever Peter first runs in and they, he doesn't even run in. He just like walks into the bank and like none of them see him. And so then he's like trying to figure out how am I going to stand? Like, what is my, I got to do my cool guy. But like, he just <laughs> like Peter Parker, my sweet, soft spider son, whom I love with all my heart and soul. And I, no one hurt him or I will murder them. <laughs> it worked for me very well. This Good. whole movie but, worked for me. Yeah, it completely worked for me. I really liked when it, he had knocked down all the other heroes and it was just Thor and Hulk saying, he's like, hey, f- glad to finally meet you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a great beat there. And then, of course, him having already built the relationship with the store owner across the street that when the gun shoots off and blows up that store and he has yeah. to go save yeah, him. Yeah, Mr. Delmar. Cat, he dives right in. The way he dives in looks so cool to me. Yeah. But he's so concerned. He's like, I love this guy. This is this guy's like part of my family. I'm here every day to get a sandwich. I, I talk to him. I joke around with this guy. This is not cool that this just happened. And the cat. He saves the cat. Murph, the cat. That's fantastic. So while Peter's superheroics are unfolding, we're mm-hmm. also getting the storyline at school where he's crazy in love with Liz. He's mm-hmm. hanging out with his best friend, Ned, who immediately finds out that he is Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. And I love how quickly we dispense with that. That's yes. just very cute yeah. and was already a beat that was kind of foreshadowed in the story when we're talking about building the Lego Death Star. I've watched a couple of videos, by the way, on YouTube of people building the Lego Death Star. It's pretty amazing. 
it's, yeah. it's pretty good. Huh. The Lego it's Death Star is pretty deal. serious. Yeah. <laughs> like 3,500 pieces. It's kind of <gasps> cool. Anyway. <laughs> This is not our Lego fan hey, cast. Can we can we just actually do a video of us building that thing and making a tax write off for buying it? Definitely, <laughs> definitely. Because how much is that thing like three hundred dollars? I have no idea. I think idea it how might be it more is, than yeah. that. Okay, you guys keep talking. I'll be right back. <laughs> They're usually about ten cents a piece. So, so we get the party at Liz's place where Peter shows up and has to immediately make his excuses and leave. Firstly, and just to transform into a Spider-Man costume to right. crash the party and impress the hell out of everyone. But then, of course, he's distracted by heroics. Yeah. And immediately, as soon as he pulls up to the house, I'm like, I'm thrown out of this movie a little bit because there's no way this girl and her family affords <laughs> this house. Bum, what is bum, going on bum. here? And then the movie explains that to me by having Tombs open the door later. It's I so almost smart. had a freaking heart attack you did. in you really that did. movie theater. Like, I, like, I inhaled so much <laughs> that it held my breath for the next five minutes. I could not, I just. I was so blown away and I had no idea. And it was amazing and so perfectly done. Like, good job, movie. And done with such self-control. So much restraint. Right. We never allow the vulture to slip into malice here. He just is that creepy. And his relationship with Peter is that complicated. And I love the sequence where he's figuring out that Peter is Spider-Man in the back yeah. of the car. <laughs> Gotta stop saying Spider-Man, you guys. <laughs> when he's figuring out Peter's super heroic identity in the car, that is such a great... It, it's so oh God, I was controlled so and studied terrified. and focused. And the way that the cinematography just starts bleeding out. We just start, we, we're no longer shooting the sequence like it's the rest of the movie. Now we're shooting it like it's some incredibly stylized noir movie. Right. It gets really intense yeah. and graphic. And it does that thing where we're trying to keep it really tense, but we're throwing in humor. Yep. But it doesn't ever lose the tension because of the humor. And that's exactly what you want from a Spider-Man comic. It's exactly what you want from a Spider-Man movie that he can quip and you don't lose the tension. On the ferry holding it together, he can quip, but you don't lose the tension. Yeah. Here when uh, the vulture confronts him and then he walks into school and then Zendaya flips him off, but you don't lose the <laughs> Attention. Yeah, absolutely right. It's perfect. It's perfect. FYI, the Lego Star Wars Death Star is four hundred and ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents. Patreon.com slash common room. And that's not even like there's another one that. that's seventy one hundred dollars. Is that made of gold? Actual no, I gold? think it might be the very first Lego Death Star. Is it an actual working Death Star? Mm, yes. Doesn't look like it. <laughs> because I will need it to keep the outer planets in line. <laughs> not for long. Not after we blow them up. <laughs> then they're super out of line. <laughs> hey -o. So Peter slips away from the party and we get our first interaction with Donald Glover, who yep. is just fantastic throughout playing so, Aaron Davis. I just need prowler. to like hold somebody up. I don't want to like blast him <laughs> back in time. Yeah. And I really like that you get Spider-Man not having anything to web sling on he's having to run across a golf yeah, course and he's like this really sucks <laughs> yeah. there have been jokes kicking around to spider-man comics for the longest time about spider-man in suburbia this is why he lives in the city because yes. web swinging is easy i love that we just integrate it so beautifully and the movie doesn't have to call it out we mm -hmm. don't have to like really pay reference to that to yeah. how clever we're being we just get to be clever which yeah. is great and donald glover's character here one of the reasons why he later will give Spider-Man information is because Spider-Man steps in when he has a gun point yeah. and says, if you want to shoot somebody, shoot me. He technically saves that guy's life. Possibly. He absolutely yeah. does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is great. Peter is then tracked to the school by the second <laughs> shocker who's, who's following the, the power core, the glowy thing. Then we get the switch to Maryland. We get the switch to Washington, D.C. Yes. Right. Peter rejoins the academic decathlon, I suppose that's yeah. what it's called. Is that the a quiz real team. thing? No, it really absolutely is. Academic is... decathlon specifically is a real thing. Uh, probably so. That's probably... What are the 10 events in an academic decathlon? <laughs> no, it's 10 subjects, I bet. Oh, it probably is, isn't it? Yeah. I yeah. want it to be 10 events. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, uh, you know, history smarts, math smarts, hero smarts, uh, SSR smarts <laughs> slash shield um, poetry English lit uh, I don't know ancient lit the wit and wisdom of Nick Fury the wit and wisdom of Nick Fury uh, red room um, <laughs> and uh, black widows dating profiles Okay, that covers it. Yeah. I, I've checked, and you're absolutely right. Congratulations. I, thank you. You win academic decathlon. I am the national champion of <laughs> academic decathlon. That is false. <laughs> <laughs> I Ding, uh, Flash the, is wrong. <laughs> what did I tell you about using the bell for jokes? <laughs> oh, my God. Can we talk about Martin Starr? Can we talk about how spectacular Martin yeah, Starr Martin is Star in this is movie really as the teacher? Is he even named in the film? I don't think that he is, but this is his second appearance in a Marvel movie. Really? Because he's a computer tech back in Hulk. Right. What? 
What? Yeah, it's like a two second shot. Wait, the Hulk that counts? Yes, the Hulk okay. that counts. <laughs> in that movie. So I just really want to believe smash. that. One smash. That two <laughs> smash. <laughs> Sorry, I just couldn't. <laughs> oh my God, I just got it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to believe that that computer tech just like decided that enough was enough. I'm going to leave working for <laughs> S.H.I.E.L.D. or Thunderbolt Ross or whatever mm-hmm. and now just go and yeah. get my teaching diploma. That, and <laughs> that scene where he goes, I couldn't lose a student on a field trip. Yes. Not again. <laughs> Which is played as a joke. And yes, we all laughed. But then afterwards, you're like, oh, wait. And he's just wait, staring at the camera. So <laughs> like with his oh, eyes no. slowly misting over. Like that had to have been an ad lib, right? And they just loved it so I, much. Yeah. They kept it that in. From Martin yeah. Starr. Yeah. Yes. This carries us into our first major set piece of the movie, which is the Washington Monument mm-hmm. set piece. What did you guys make of this, Sarah? As I said earlier, you were incredibly tense throughout the entire I thing. was. Okay. Well, here's the thing is that I have seen superhero movies before. And I have also seen Spider-Man movies before. And I was certain that someone was going to die in that elevator shaft yeah. and I did or all of them I was like oh god are we gonna kill every single one of these kids and this is how we motivate Peter to like go do the thing and I was so t- like I'm like on the edge of my seat just staring and like praying to Stan Lee to please God please <laughs> don't let these children die on this trip yeah for me, I might have questioned it. I might have wondered why they were doing this, why they were going here. But Zendaya's two lines actually save it for me and just really made me not even care or think about it when she, they're first getting on the bus. And she's like, am I going to have time to put some light protesting in at, at some of the embassies? And then later when she's like, I didn't really feel like looking at something that was uh, created by slaves. And then he's like, I don't think it was actually. And then he turns to the guard and the guard's like, oh. <laughs> okay, well then. <laughs> I would, w- God, you know what I wish? I wish that we could watch this entire movie from the viewpoint of Michelle. Yes. Like, I just want to see, like, Michelle's weird couple of weeks where that Peter Parker kid was just being a total rando. I'm not sure he was that different before he goes. I'm not obsessed. I'm just observant. (laughs) That's very good. God, she's so good. This entire sequence to me just demonstrates why Spider-Man is the hero that he is because he keeps failing, Mm -hmm. but he fails upwards. Every time he fails, he gets a step closer to saving everyone. And that is absolutely worth it. The leaping from the top of the monument, which again is a sequence that we saw in the trailer and is Mm -hmm. interestingly subverted in the movie itself where he uses this arc around the helicopter thanks to his webs to Mm -hmm. to smash through the tiny, tiny, very tiny window. Peter, you're really good at what you do because (laughs) it could have broken real bad for you there, buddy. He manages to save everyone, but it is through this succession of calamities. Mm-hmm. He tries and fails and tries and fails and just keeps trying. And he doesn't give until up. Until it works. He's a real hero. Even when he plummets down into the mist at the bottom of the mine shaft and Flash calls out after him, do you know Peter Parker? God, Flash, you're yeah, the worst. Well done. It's just, ah, I love it so, so much. We had mentioned before when we were talking just after the movie about wondering why they had gone to the scene. I, I think it occurred to me that he needed a reason to get this tracker out. He had to go find those guys. But yeah. That didn't happen. Yeah. That have to happen dc but he had to leave new york to have the problem with the tracker to really find out about the suit to unlock all the suits potential to get rid uh, of the uh, then, training wheels protocol yeah <laughs> and, and then, uh, the scene of course where he's locked in the warehouse is actually a really fun scene where he gets to train some being locked in there for yeah. a little while uh it was just a really fun scene to get see yeah. him grow into those powers a little bit there. right and I think that, yeah, and it really builds up, like, the tension that he ends up having with Tony, where Tony is like, no, I, you know, Tony is thinking, I've done everything I can to protect this kid and make sure that this kid is going to be safe and going to be fine, and then come to find out, mm, Peter's going to do what Peter wants to do, yeah. and, like, kind of, you know, go and do his own thing, and, uh, yeah, I'm sure that, I'm certain that Tony sees more than a little bit of himself in Peter Parker. Which I think is why he's so concerned. Yes, I and think it's that's exactly it. perfect. It is yeah. a perfect parallel. I love what we have done with these two characters and their relationship. Yeah, me too. Back Back in New York, we basically move into the Staten Island Ferry sequence. Mm-hmm. Now that Peter is completely empowered, now that he has something approaching mastery of his suit, <laughs> yes. we're going to challenge his ability to save everyone, and then we're going to bring in the big boys to save him. What do you guys make of the sequence on the ferry itself? Is Tony Stark right to chastise Peter for what he has done here? Is No, no of course not. L- just leave this alone? Is that yeah. sufficient? It- I think it's, it is one of those like typical father things. If he's in a father role, this is actually the way this should be played. And he even says himself, he says, I sound like my father. Yeah. And this is what happens when with a dad. Usually you're looking at your son and uh, they sit, you're only seeing half of what's going on. You're not seeing them trying. You're just seeing them messing up. And yeah, that's so a good he, point. Spider-Man's actually really trying here, but 
Tony Stark actually had everything in place. He called the FBI. He he was listening to Spider-Man. But the where he dropped the ball is he never told Spider-Man he was listening yeah, to Yeah, he should have told Spider-Man that he was doing anything. And then he acted like it was Spider-Man's fault, but mm-hmm. it was him that wasn't listening. There's so much of that through the course of the movie where Peter is feeling ignored and yeah. feeling overlooked and feeling undervalued. Yeah. But then there are all these little hints in Tony Stark's dialogue that he's actually paying very close attention. Mm-hmm. Right. And he lies and says that he's in band. And Tony says, huh, that's weird. Happy told me you quit band six weeks ago. Yeah, and he mentions the old lady that he helped out, yeah. even though that call was too happy. Not exactly. to him. Mm-hmm. So not only is happy listening to everything that Peter is saying, yes. he's reporting it all to Tony, who or is perhaps paying enough happy attention. isn't listening at all. That Tony's just too. getting yeah. those yeah. straight from him because Tony can do whatever he wants. Right. Hey, what do you guys mm-hmm. think that Tony was doing in like Bangladesh or wherever he was? I like to think that he is seeking some kind of, of spiritual calm. <laughs> I want to be, I would think clearly so. wasn't. It was some kind of ambassadorial party. I sure, think. he's just hanging out. He's just glad handing. You know, this is this is all part of his campaign to make the Avengers the the world's police. He sure, just wants yeah, the, you mm-hmm. know, international support. I just wasn't sure if there was any sort of like superhero thing that like came from maybe that part of the world that either you two knew about there immediately. Are a few, yeah. but nothing springs yeah. to mind. Certainly in the MCU, the thing that's closest of late is the only other MCU movie that has been scored by Michael Giacchino, which is Doctor Strange. Mm-hmm. Right. Interesting that he should be there around this time. And now I'm wondering about Doctor Strange's place in the timeline. Yeah, where when does that happen? Because he talks to Thor at he the end of that movie, right? He talks to Thor at the that, which is clearly leading into Ragnarok. Yeah, so prior we don't know when Ragnarok but it may, begins. That may be after the events of Ragnarok, because there are some shots for Ragnarok where we see Thor and Loki like walking around downtown wherever. Yeah. So... I think yeah. that's probably a prologue to Ragnarok, but Ragnarok could be happening. Ragnarok could right. be over before, or at least the parts of Ragnarok that touch Earth could be over before the Civil War. So we sure. have no idea. Yeah, I think have... these timelines are definitely going to cement more once we get to Infinity War, once we have Ragnarok and... Yeah. Once everything out. is like put and together, yeah. Infinity War starts happening, it's really going to, I think, tie everything in. You're going to go, oh, this is how these slot together now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Someone at Marvel has realized, hey, we should be paying more attention to this. Yes. Okay, let's start fixing it now, <laughs> and then it'll make more sense in four movies' time. Do you guys like the Staten Island ferry sequence? I the, do. The cleaning of the ferry in Twain. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah, for you? I really love it when he is trying his best and he's he's still adapting, but he's learned a few yeah. things. And so he's like, suit, find the structural points, and yeah. he's trying to tie them all together. He's trying his best. That guy yells out, "Spider Man, yeah. yeah!" And then the suit goes. Great job, Peter. You're ninety eight percent successful, which of course means it's not going to yeah. work. Even yeah. though that is like a, that's a, that's an A plus, yeah. but it's not good enough because it's still going to fall apart. And he's like, "What? No!" And then of course Iron Man comes in to save the day, and it's just a great scene there where of course Iron Man can he has the technology to push the shit back. Yeah. Sure, the yeah. Shut. And Spider Man's like, Miss Mister Stark, can I do anything? Can I do anything? He's like, "No, you've done enough." Yeah. Their entire conversation there is so good. Like, I love whenever Peter is like, if you really cared, you'd actually be here. And then Tony actually pops out of the suit. Falling back to when he wasn't in the suit earlier. Oh, Oh. gosh. And it's so good. Like, I think I gasped aloud because I was like, oh, no. Oh, God. We, like, dad is so angry. We are in so much trouble. And just, yeah. Yeah, He uh, steps out of that suit with such force and power. Yes. Like, walks right up into his face. Yeah. Yeah. I cannot, I literally cannot talk enough about how much I adore the relationship between Peter and Tony and just, God, it's so good. It's so good. I love it so much. It's amazing. And this is another bullet dodge because I was fearful. We'd seen this scene in the trailers and I was fearful of Peter suspended between the two halves of the ferry and the Christ imagery associated mm-hmm. with that. But it's not that. That is not the purpose of the scene at all. He isn't sacrificing himself to save everyone on the ferry. Right. He's just trying. He's mm-hmm. still trying. And even when Iron Man comes in and saves the day. Peter is still trying. Yeah. He still wants to help. He will it's not really just like take sequence. a breather. Like he won't, yeah, right. he won't stop until the job is done. It's just, just fantastic. It's a shame that like Cap isn't around to raise this kid. Cause I feel like Steve would really appreciate <laughs> a lot of these characteristics. So then we take away the suit, which mm-hmm. is a really nice beat. And Peter returns home wearing his New York tourist t-shirt, yes. I guess, which I kind of like too. And that gives us our opportunity to move back into the high school story where we mm-hmm. reconnect with Liz. Peter asks her to the homecoming dance. It's all very beautiful. We find out her dad is the vulture. That's where things get a little more complicated. Yep. Yeah, admittedly. And I love the moment when Peter goes to the dance. We talked a little briefly about his scenes yes. with the vulture. Those are all great. But when he walks into the dance and he is clearly conflicted he is is yeah. caught in this moment caught between these two worlds he's having all of the every adult around him who knows who he is is basically saying stay out of this yeah. like stop quit stop what you're doing just go be a kid and don't even worry about it but peter could do this all day yeah. oh. <laughs> oh that hurt my heart oh, that really good. hurt my heart right then <laughs> 
So Peter decides that he is, in fact, going to take the fight to the vulture that he's going to figure out what is going on. Mm -hmm. He gets his old costume back, which I just love. I love how ratty and run down it is. Yes. It's just really good. And I'm reminded of the beat that we have in Civil War when he's introduced about the goggles Mm -hmm. and about how ever since he was bitten by the spider, ever since he got his powers, his senses have been super heightened. And now he has to filter those out so that he can fight effectively. That's one of the things that the mask does, one of the things that the goggles do. Did it bother you at all that there's no indication of that in this movie whatsoever? That no, because I already seem knew to it. Be super sensitive. Yeah, no. When he's not yeah, wearing the mask. Yeah, no, no, didn't, didn't bug really me. really bother me because I, I kind of felt like he can still function that way. Yeah. It just if he's in a high stakes battle, he's going to have some problems. Sure. And he needs to be able to like when his adrenaline is running right. and already he's yeah. more aware anyway. And there's so much going on. Yeah. yeah. So Peter confronts Tombs, he confronts the vulture while Happy is loading the last of the supplies Mm -hmm. from the last of Tony Stark's objet d'art from (laughs) Stark Tower to move upstate. We then get the fight in the warehouse when the the vulture's wingsuit collapses the building and Peter has to dig deep, you guys, has to lift himself out. And I love this because this is the counterpoint to the Staten Island Ferry scene. Mm -hmm. Peter here isn't sacrificing to save everyone else. He's digging deep to save himself. Yeah. Mm. And that's really powerful for for this character, for this mm-hmm. archetype. Because his heroism in the defense of others is never in question. Right. We never have to challenge that. We never have to tempt him to turn his back and, and forget about the villain. Even when he walks into the homecoming dance, he's already made up his mind. He knows yeah. what he has to do. He's caught in this conflict because he knows it's going to be hard. He's mm-hmm. giving up something incredibly important to him. Mm-hmm. But this isn't a difficult choice for him. Right. But this is the moment where he really has to believe in himself. And yeah, I got choked up watching that. I really yeah, did. me too. Yep. No, I just straight up cried. There yeah. was no choking up. I just <laughs> was weeping. Beautiful. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then airplane battle. You and guys? then airplane battle, yeah. I really like the infiltration of the airplane. I really yes. like how clever the vulture is. I like how smart the vulture is throughout, actually. I love yeah. that it's yeah. this absolutely scavenger mentality that he's sneak attacking mm-hmm. these convoys, taking things without being noticed. Yeah. Things that will, you know, presumably show up on a spreadsheet somewhere, but won't actually physically be missed. Right. And I really like that it's this isn't the vulture's idea here. This has been the tinkerer's idea, and the vulture's yeah. saying, "No, this is too big of a job. This is too risky. This is not something we do." But then he's come down to his last resort, and he needs more stuff because he has jobs coming up. He has he has uh, sales coming up that he can't yeah. meet the quotas of because he doesn't have the items anymore because Spider Man yeah. keeps putting his stuff to him. He's like finally like. All right, you've been pushing this idea. Let's go ahead and try it because I'm out of options. Yeah, yeah. the high altitude vacuum idea mm-hmm. is really, really good, and I love the little uh, the little cubes that you use to make the matter permeable to, yes. to phase shift mm-hmm. the matter. Right. And that's it's so perfectly great. introduced because if he had just yes. like flown down and thrown it on that truck, you would have been like, "What the hell is that? Where'd that come yeah. from?" But you saw the tinker when he was making things, threw it up on the side of the fridge, reached in and grabbed yeah. like a drink or something, yes. pulled it back out, and you're like, oh, "Okay, that's funny." And then they use it. And it's like they really do a good job of setting things up. In they this really, film. really they, do. Yeah. Yeah. Small yeah. things that you don't even notice, like the fact that the plane doesn't have any pilots. Well, mm-hmm. we learned that Tony Stark's planes don't have pilots when. Peter Parker first got on his jet to fly the Civil War and he went, hey, there's no pilots in the plane. That's cool. Mm -hmm. And even when I'm complaining about the plane being invisible, which I do think is unnecessary, that's helicarrier technology. That's quizzet technology. We've seen that before many times now. Mm -hmm. So all of it works together. And every one of those little details makes us feel more connected to the MCU. Yes. Every one of those details makes it feel as though this is a real world with, with yes, you know, real It's going to make literally every person on the planet, except for Sony, forget that this is a Sony yes. film. Which I think at this point is probably what Sony wants. Thank you. I, we, will, we will take that paycheck, please. And thank <laughs> you. Yes. Then we have the crash on the beach near Coney Island, which is beautifully staged, beautifully done. Mm-hmm. Peter turning the aileron there to turn the plane. That's yes. so good. Yeah. That's so it's smart. Straight out of a recent Batman comic, actually. Oh, Batman really? The same oh, thing really? The plane, <laughs> uh, by Tom King, where there's a plane crashing through Gotham and Batman has to jump on it and use his, uh, his tools to pull the, the wing up and so it'll go sideways and just go right between two wow. buildings rather than hitting either oh, of them. Oh, man. We sure <laughs> like Tom King. Yeah, we he's sure do. fantastic. We, we sure do. So the plane crashes. Mm-hmm. There is a brief fight between... Peter, who is now in bad condition, and the vulture. Yeah, and the, the moment where the vulture is punching him, you really get this picture of this is an adult punching a 15-year-old. Yes. This is an like adult in a robot suit yeah. punching a 15-year-old like, boy. He looks helpless there. Yeah. Like, yeah. He's getting punched in the face over and over again. He's just out. He's trying his best to get up, and he just keeps falling. Yeah. And mm-hmm. the claws on his chest, the, yeah, the whole yeah, thing is the very whole visceral, thing. very, very And real. he still chooses to go and save Tombs mm-hmm. because... I'm trying to save you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, your suit's going to explode. Stop, stop. Yeah. So great. Yeah, running through the fire 
to yes. get to tombs is just and then like burning his hands on the metal but then going yeah. for it anyway like god peter peter parker fails upwards this is what i'm saying so all of this plays out as we've discussed peter goes back to school and we learn that liz is moving away because her father doesn't want her yeah. in town hey liz survived this movie you guys hey great i was great sure job, she was liz. gonna she die got shipped off and then yeah. she had a villain for her dad but yeah. she survived but liz, she made it yeah, liz yeah. to tell the tale she's like, gonna have a happier life in oregon it's gonna be just fine it's real pretty does there does it bother you guys that peter parker shows up without a scratch at school <laughs> after I being sense, so bloody well, have no, so, many, so many marks time has passed because it's been long enough that tombs has been not just arrested but also arraigned That's we know true. that there's going to be a and trial also, in my mind like i came up with a reason for it is that peter's been in a few scuffles he's probably fought a couple of bank robbers yeah. or whatever at this point he probably has a makeup set. And he puts makeup I also just yeah. assume that, that he, like, like all superheroes are enhanced individuals, just heals quicker than he everybody probably else. Does. He probably does. That I think quicker. might actually be canonical yeah. in, in the MCU. Um, too. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah surely, he, especially after his fight with Captain America, having to explain the black guy, he's like, you know what? I'm going to buy some makeup and yeah. make sure that <laughs> I don't look all beat up all the time. Right, right. <laughs> so from there, we get the beat with Happy in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. We go up to the new Avengers compound. Yeah, I guess compound is that, that we can't keep calling it the bunker. We keep referring to it as the bunker, but it's clearly not that. So yeah, the Avengers compound upstate. Which I kind of like. Yes. And this is it. Peter gets to join the Avengers. He gets a brand new, absolutely breathtaking Iron Spider suit. Gorgeous, gorgeous Iron Spider suit. But he turns the offer down because he wants to stay the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man because someone has to watch out for the little guy. Yeah. And, and then the next is... two and a half minutes are just the greatest ever. Just, this is a test, right? There's nobody behind that door. Yep. And you passed. Good job, <laughs> kids. See you in the car. Skedaddle. And the pepper pots coming out of the door sworn with reporters just being like, Where's the kid? What I are we doing? Gasped audibly. Yeah. When Pepper Potts showed up. Like, I, did I knew not something was going to happen all. because Vinton was on my left side and he leaned forward, turned his whole body so that he could like <laughs> be watching my face during this sequence. And I'm just like, what's it like? What, I mean, we've already seen Chris Evans a couple of times. Who else could possibly show? Oh my God. <laughs> There was a few moments where I feel like I might have ruined something for Sarah because I knew she was going to freak out, so I just put my hand on her leg <laughs> <laughs> when it was about to happen. I was like, just calm down. And I'm just like, like something's going to stop. Okay, some big's coming. Some big's are coming. Some, some bracing here. It did nothing to diminish the emotional intensity that Sarah experienced. No, that. yeah, um, I uh, so. went supernova, but then I got better, so it's fine. Finally, Peter returns home. He's that there. smile that's on his face when he walks out of the compound, yeah. too, is great. Oh, that's like he gets really good. Yeah. Tom smile. Holland is so good. He goes home, finds the package, the brown paper bag from Tony Stark containing his suit, the, yes. the powered suit. Right. He puts it on. He's feeling really good. And that's when Aunt May walks in. <laughs> what, what the, the fuck? fuck? And, then the and that's how we close and out the movie, you guys. Credits. They, they, then we tell the whole story of the movie in like yeah. cartoon fashion. Mm-hmm. With, with really, yeah, like really great kind of early 1980s punk aesthetic, yeah. which yes. I just it's love. Fantastic. I love to death. Can we talk about how canonically Marissa Tomei is the hottest woman in the MCU? <laughs> Apparently so, yeah. Because everyone just loves her. Yes. Everybody loves her. This is so She's good. She's getting free food at the Thai restaurant. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Sandwich guy loves her. Yeah. <laughs> Tony <Every>, Stark. <laughs> yeah, everyone is in love with Aunt May, which is great. Uh, and I love that the next time we get a Spider-Man movie, we're not going to have to deal with Aunt May not knowing. Like, I love that too. I'm so yeah. pleased about that. Yeah. That's it's so good. It, this is such a purposeful step forward too. It isn't just a great movie, mm-hmm. but it is a great movie that will serve as a platform for movies to come. I'm yes. really excited. He's a sophomore in this movie, mm-hmm. so we get two more Peter Parker High School movies. Yeah, that is, I'm certain. Which how this is, is as play soon out. as the credits are rolling, uh, what I said was, I want 30 more of these. Yes. I want like I want yeah. so much more of this yeah. particular yeah. thing. And we already know from Kevin Feige talking that Spider-Man is going to be the crux of the Marvel Universe moving forward after Infinity War. Mm-hmm. That Spider-Man Two is going to follow up directly on those events. It's going to take the the flagship title pretty much of what's going to happen the new phase of the MCU. And it sounds like, from what he has said, it sounds like some of those heroes that we've already had are going to be retiring or mm-hmm. disappearing. We're yeah. going to be getting into whole new heroes, which makes me think there's going to be something like the champions, like a, a younger team led yes. by, by, like, by like Spider-Man like or something. Like Kamala Avengers, Khan, Nova Khan, kind of. perhaps. Something like that. Yeah, <laughs> Young mm-hmm. Avengers. Yeah, I'm really we'll into that happens. idea. And that would, of course, give us a perfect opportunity to introduce, you know, Miles. We can yeah. bring Miles Morales in as Spider-Man Jr. Mm-hmm. Spider-ling. Spider- Spider-Boy. Spider-Boy. <laughs> Spider-Boy. I'm Spider-Man. Spider-Man. <laughs> hey, are you the spider guy? Spider-Man, do a backflip. <laughs> <laughs> and then he does it. Do a flip guy good. is maybe my favorite guy in this entire movie. I love that guy so, so much. So what was, what is your favorite part of this oh, movie? No. Oh boy. 
there's just so much to choose I from. I really, really do think that my favorite part is the conversation between Tony and Peter on the ferry, and then whenever Peter gets back home and uh, May opens the door, and oh. she's so mad. And she doesn't say anything. Like, that's such a oh, parent yeah, thing to do. Yeah. She gets so angry and then storms off, and then she's yelling at him, and then is like, you know, what's going on? What's this and that? And he just goes... I lost the Stark internship and he starts crying and then she just holds on to him like that yeah, that she entire completely sequence completely changes yeah. in yes. like, yeah, oh, the, I need to protect you yeah okay. the yeah. fighting with this. parents <laughs> scene right yeah. there in the middle of the movie is my absolute favorite yeah it's just fantastic beautiful and per- everyone does such a good job good job movie. Good jo- great job <laughs> great job <laughs> great job I think my favorite part of the movie is the Ferris Bueller sequence it's the running through the suburban backyards uh-huh. because that shows how much energy and enthusiasm and dedication Peter has that mm-hmm. he just doesn't give up and he keeps screwing up, crashing through the fence, crashing right. the little girl. Knocks with the down pot the treehouse. Tent the yes, knocking down the treehouse is such a great feat. <laughs> so it's just again and again and again and he's just screwing up, but he's doing so with the best of intentions and it is still heroic. I, right. mm-hmm. I love that. that yeah. That's yeah. my Peter Parker right yeah. there. That's so brilliant. My favorite part of the film is the is whole film. Just after the Sony, fil- the Sony logo shows and uh, right up until Captain America America's last scene on the <laughs> end credits. Oh, so, so the whole film. Yeah, the, the that was my favorite part. I know it's a little bit of a longer part, but that two and a half hours, it's really good. <laughs> it's a very good part of the movie. <laughs> hey, Sarah, what are we doing next week here on Excelsior? Next week, we're taking the week off. We sure are, because Vinton's abandoning us. That's yes, and then so am I. For the appeal of the West Coast. I guess you are, too. Yeah, I'll be alone in the studio next mm-hmm. week. You guys, if you would like me to record a solo podcast of Excelsior, too bad. I'm not doing that thing. <laughs> That would be really sad and lonesome, and I don't want to do it. So we're going to wait. What are you? Oh, you're not here. Sarah, what? Oh, you're not here either. <laughs> we're going to wait until the team is reassembled. In Mostly reassembled in two weeks. Mostly, yes. yes. You and I are going to sit down with Elizabeth Stevens, whom mm-hmm. we adore, to discuss probably just the first season, I think. Of Agent Carter. Of Marvel's Agent Carter, yes. which is a show that is very near to our hearts. Yes, so we have really the next two weeks show. to watch all of that, which is great. And then we'll have something the following week. Mm-hmm. TBD. Yep. We'll, we'll talk about it when we get there, you guys. Boy, yep. you don't need to know all of our secrets. <laughs> We're paying it close to... There's going to be a post-credit sequence at the end of next week's show when we tell you what to look forward to next. <laughs> Spider-Man will return in... Uh... Oh, man, if you guys enjoyed this show, and how couldn't you, honestly? <laughs> Uh, and you want to support us, you can head over to patreon.com slash common room radio where you can kick us a dollar a month or whatever you can afford. And you can get gag reels and all kinds of other special stuff. We'll send you a postcard. It'll be great. It'll be wonderful. It'll be lovely. Uh, you can talk to us on Twitter at Excelsior Cast. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Sarah Cade Pizant. You can find me on Twitter at Paper Bullets. You can find me on Twitter at Flesh Either. And you can hear more from me from the Read Brave Comics podcast. Except that you guys are taking off the yeah, month. Ta- <laughs> we are taking off this You're month. You're on vacation. But... There's plenty of back stuff. That Lots of to stuff say. on there. Yes, I'm on the show. Alistair's on the show. That's friend true. of the show. Emily's on the show. Um, so many people. So many so great many creators, people. too. <laughs> yes, Great wonderful. interviews on that show. Uh, yeah, so, okay. All right, so we will not see you guys next week, but in two weeks we will come back and do Agent Carter with Elizabeth. Uh, and so until then, once again from Common Room Radio, I'm Sarah K. Bazant. I'm Alistair Stevens. And I'm Vinton Bain. Hi, I'm Vinton Bain, and patience is a very important thing for all (laughs) podcast listeners. Sometimes you wait around for something, and it's, it's, it's something really important. It's something really great, but other times you just think to yourself, why did I wait for this? How many more of these do I have to do, Alistair? You'll work until I tell you to stop. Excelsior!